Well, go ahead and uh, start, start with introductions here and thank everybody for joining us today for the Kickstarter Venture Services final installment of 2020 uh, for our Kickstart Presents webinar series. Yeah, today's uh, webinar is going is called Ready, Set, Invest, Tips on Preparing for Investor Meetings. And we have a fantastic uh, session uh, for you today here. You know, we'll have experts from business development, legal experts, uh, also a Q&A session with the Carolina Angel Network uh, leadership team and a successful UNC startup, Inalan Alaya Pharma. So let me start by introducing uh, some of our uh, presenters today. I'll start with somebody who a lot of you already know, uh, I'm very familiar with here, Dan Rose. He used to be director of Kickstart Venture Services. So we're very excited about having him here today. Uh, he's now a special advisor to Hatteras Venture Partners, one of our leading venture capital uh, firms here in the Triangle. And you know, again, those who know uh, Don know he has so much experience in so many fields. Uh, at UNC, working at Kickstart, he helped over uh, 80 spin-out companies. You know who have gone and raised you know over half a, a billion uh, dollars in the 10 years he's been there. Uh, he also has a fantastic book that I highly recommend to to everybody here: A Practical Guide to University Startups uh, in 2016. He's also you know works. Uh, 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 yeah, as a professor too in the practice of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurship and business at the UNC uh, uh, Keenan Flagner Business School. But besides all that, you know, he's had a lot of experience from the startup side as well, uh, working in senior positions at uh, several startup companies, including Metabolon, Direct Fluidics, and Data Centric Automation. And of course, now working uh, at Hatteras and also associated with Alexandria uh, and a wealth of, of uh, information here. So he'll be presenting on um, the first, uh, uh, first of our two presentations on fishing for investment. Our second presenter is also very experienced. It's Matthew Mayer. You know, he was the chief client corporate development advisor for Wilson Sonsini. You know, and you know, at, at Wilson Sonsini, he has you know, a, a lot of experience in the life sciences. You know, he leads the firm's business uh, life science business advisory practice. Yeah, uh, who provides uh, you know, uh, support to emerging life science companies with business insights, uh, capabilities, and strategies to help them thrive. You know, uh, he's a, an experienced attorney and executive who has diverse roles in a wide variety of. Uh, public and biopharma, medtech, and precision medicine companies. Yeah. Uh, prior to joining Wilson Sonsini, he was a managing director at Alvo Life Science Advisors, yeah, who was a, which is a boutique life science advisory firm uh, focused on biotech startups. And prior to that, he was the senior vice president of corporate development at Council, a venture uh, in uh, private equity-backed personalized medicine company. So again, experience working with companies as well as venture capital, and also a lot of experience working with life science companies, which I know many of you in the audience are. And um, besides our two presenters today, we, we also have as part of our panel and Q&A session after the two presentations, we have Chelsea Isragi, who's a co-managing director of the Carolina Angel Network joining us. Uh, for those of, of you who've also probably heard of Carolina Angel Network community here, but it brings the UNC entrepreneurial community and the alumni network, you know, to empower early stage businesses to drive a few, uh, you know, their future and really help them with that much needed angel investment. Uh, Can has invested over 15 million in, you know, over 20 companies yeah, here in the triangle. So again, we're very excited about having her here. And importantly, also, Chelsea has a lot of experience working with different, you know, uh, firms as well. Besides Can, she's worked uh, in Casla Capital Management, uh, a New York uh, private equity firm. Firm and she's also um, worked at Imperial Capital and Global Hunter Securities. Yeah. Uh, and she has a lot of experience in due diligence. So when when you are thinking about approaching venture capitalists, you know she is really experiencing what they're looking for and that due diligence and what makes a deal go through or not. You know, and and uh, those comments that she'll bring to the discussion are very important as well. Uh, and also, uh, we have representing the startups, uh, John Willen, who is CEO and president of Inalon. Uh, he has over 20 years of working with many uh, venture-backed and biotech companies. He's gone on and raised over 240 million over the years in, in equity 
financing collaborations. Uh, he has different roles as presidents and CEOs. Uh, uh, some of the companies he worked with include Neuraltus Pharma, uh, a private company developing treatments for ALS. And he also worked for Heron Therapeutics, uh, who's a specialty pharma company. Uh, and it's re really led uh, the turnaround of, of their, one of their uh, products called Sustol, uh, it's a chemotherapy for patients. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, before we actually start the two sessions, I also want to introduce Michael Clarence, uh, who's an equity funding specialist for the SBTDC, which stands for the Small Business Technology Development Center, which is also a great and fantastic resource for all of our entrepreneurs here in the Triangle. I highly encourage you to get in touch with them. And I wanted to give him the opportunity to present uh, just a couple of slides on a new uh, workshop that is coming that is also very related to today's topic. Uh, the title of their workshop is Becoming an Investor Ready Entrepreneur and is designed to educate and prepare growth oriented entrepreneurs uh, to successfully engage private equity investors. So uh, think about it this way. Our webinar today is like introduction to, to investors, uh, pitching for investment 101. And this is really going a lot deeper uh, into the practical stuff in, in these workshops uh, over a couple of days. So, uh, Mike, do you want to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about the workshop? Sure, I'd love to. And, and thank you so much for the time to uh, jump on and, and um, speak about this just real briefly before you get to the, to the, the real panelists that have all the information for you today. Um, you already did a little introduction there for me, um, but I'm Mike Carnes, Equity Funding Specialist and Technology Commercialization Counselor with the North Carolina SBTDC. Uh, we're an organization that can provide support to, to early stage companies as you're uh, you know, spinning out of universities at an early stage, thinking about uh, your overall fundraising strategy, whether that be through non-dilutive funding programs like the SBIR and STTR program, or thinking about raising equity capital. Uh, this particular event is focused on uh, raising capital. Um, it's an event that we've been doing for over 15 years now, and we're excited to be presenting this event virtually for the very first time ever, um, which is, is a great thing because it's allowing us to, to have a great, greater reach and, and connect with a lot of companies from across the region. Um, you know, Investor Ready Entrepreneur is really developed to help companies understand the norms and expectations of the investment community. You know, the problem that entrepreneurs often face when they're, when they're starting off is um, that they have misconceptions about the process of raising capital. Um, they may not understand uh, the concepts of raising the appropriate type of capital at the appropriate stage. Uh, and they oftentimes have a hard time understanding investor expectations. And so the Investor Ready Entrepreneur Program is really all about leveling that playing field for entrepreneurs. And we really focus on um, taking entrepreneurs step by step through all the different uh, parts of the process of raising capital and what that's going to look like. We, um, we, we help them to get oriented to the landscape and understand the different types of investors, the, the types of deals they typically fund and the structures of those deals. Uh, and then we have investor panelists who talk about their specific expectations throughout the event. So we have a panel for the duration of the event. We have different modules um, that we'll teach and then the investor panelists are, are present for the entire thing and give um, real-time feedback and answer questions about each topic. The, the topics that we cover are a uh, general introduction to the um, investment process, investor expectations for ROI, we talk about the funding landscape, uh, how to build a company that's going to be attractive in the eyes of investors. We talk about funding needs and financials and how to project those funding needs. We talk about how to find investors and target uh, target investors. We talk about the, uh, pres the presentation, which is you know something that everybody talks about a lot, but it's only a small part of the overall uh, process. Uh, we go into a discussion about the due diligence process and what you can expect from that. We we talk about valuation, which is always one of the hottest topics of the day. And then we go into a discussion about you know deal structure and boards and exits. We'll also have a keynote speaker for this particular event. We have Robert Prevel from Quip, who is a serial entrepreneur and, and also an equity investor. Uh, we're going to have reverse pitches from a number of different um, investment groups from our area. 
you can check our website if you'd like to see a little bit more information about that. And then our investor panelists are, are that will be um, part of the event are listed on on this particular flyer. But we have um, investors from across the region, and uh, you know, look forward to, to ha having you attend the event. If you have questions, you can you can reach out to me directly at mcarns at sbtdc.org or here's our website and you'll probably get a copy of these slides. So thank you again for the time um, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the future and please reach out if I can be helpful. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, Don, please go ahead. Thank you, Maria. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, the opportunity to talk about uh, getting ready to invest. Um, Sharing the screen. I love it. People always say, can you see my slides? So can you see my slides? <laughs> I hope you can see it because I can't see them or I can't see you. So um, I want to kind of do a couple things today very briefly as we don't have a lot of time. We really want to kind of get to your questions, but wanted to first kind of give you an overview of startup funding and what that looks like and how kind of how things operate really, sort of the, the, the machinery, if you will, of investing. And then uh, give you some brief insights into how investors think and how do they think about things like risk and reward and how they balance those two out uh, as they think about their, their investments. So just to get started, as an overview of startup funding, um, you know, the basic premise here, of course, is you've got some sort of idea some sort of uh, thought about a, a product and you need to get to that product at some some way. And the, really the only way to get to that product is with some fuel and that fuel is money, capital, cash, whatever you wanna call it. And so the questions that always come up are, you know, how much money is it gonna to take to get there, to get to the goal line? Uh, when should I get it? Uh, and when, sh when should it be, you know, staged out over this period of time? And where should it come from? So we're gonna talk about some of these uh, briefly today. So just to kind of give you a, a picture of the universe as I see it, there's kind of the university side where I spent a lot of my time. And now there's more of the company side where I'm now spending more of my time. And you're trying to obviously a lot, a lot of uh, things that you're working on are coming from the university out into the startup company. And these are kind of the activities that happen kind of at a high level along the way. There's research that happens and there's something called technology development, which is more proof of concept and feasibility. Then you launch a company, you create, you develop a product, go through clinical trials, and then eventually you launch your product. You might have an acquisition, you might go public. And then to do that, you have to have some sort of investment vehicle to, to carry out those activities. And so on that academic side, of course, those are research grants. On the company side, that can be a combination of grants and investments. And as things develop, then it becomes much more uh, of an investment sort of thing. And this is just the sort of the sources of some of that capital. Again, the government typically is funding uh, a lot of these grants early on in the kind of pre-seed or seed stage. And then once you get out into the uh, more investment category, uh, you're gonna have angel investors and venture capital investors investing uh, into these different activities. And so today we're really gonna focus on this latter part of the, uh, of the investment cycle, which is the uh, the capital investment from angel groups and venture capitalists. And just to be really clear about this, these grants and these awards are what's called non-dilutive funding, which means you still own as much as you owned before you got the grant or, or the award. Uh, what we're gonna talk about is angel uh, funding or venture capital funding. Uh, these are investments. Investments meaning uh, you are uh, diluting your ownership to a certain extent, but increasing the value, hopefully, of your company, which we'll talk about in a second. So investments is really what we want to talk about. And that's uh, really, at the end of the day, just, just to be clear that people make investments only for one reason, and that's to uh, make money. They may love you. They may love your product. They may love the fact that you're going to uh, help the world. But at the end of the day, they're interested in making money. And that's the reason they make their investments. Now, they can do both. But the primary driver for a lot of investments is, is uh, to increase the value of their, of their investment. So, of course, the way it works is uh, an investor makes an investment into your, into your company, 
And uh, as a part of that, they they own some uh, some piece of that company, some 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 shares or units of that of that company, uh, and then they eventually sell those units off, uh, cash in on that on that investment, and have some sort of return on that investment, which is an ROI, which is not a report of invention for the folks coming from the from the academic side. So the way this works, just to, at a kind of a high level, is if you if you think about the whole process. You may have a single investor who invests in your company early on and you use that money to meet some sort of milestones, meet some sort of technical milestones or business milestones. And then your business grows, you need more money, you have more investors that invest, you meet more milestones and so on. So it's a, and that process goes along where there's a small amount of money at first because the risk is very high and there's a larger amount of money later as you, as you uh, need more money and the risk is lower. So just to give you a, uh, a very uh, kind of high level uh, case study, if you will, imagine you have a company and you need money and you have an, a $1 million investment. And we see um, this idea of the uh, uh, company has, has a, a valuation of say $2 million. Again, this is arbitrary at this point and we, and we can talk more about um, pre-money valuation, but a uh, million dollars is invested. Your company's worth $3 million. You give away some of the ownership. The, the part in green goes to the investor, the founders and the management team own the rest. And with that $3 million, or sorry, with that $1 million investment, you meet these milestones, which create some value. And if you're, if you're doing well, then now you're worth $5 million. And now you have a $10 million investment. So a company value of $15 million. Again, investors are diluting the ownership pie and uh, have owning more of the company, but the company has is, is worth more. And then I kind of con con to complete this example, a $50 million investment uh, it means the investors own, in this case, three quarters of the, of the company, but we have a company that's worth a lot of money. So the investors own this, own this equity now what? Well, what they do, of course, is that they have to um, somehow liquidate that and get some sort of return on investment. And so if your company, let's say, is worth $200 million and you have a liquidity event, which is either a public offering or an acquisition, then the proceeds of that are split among the different, uh, different uh, uh, owners of the company. And so just to kind of complete the story, a $61 million investment by these investors ends up being $150 million return on investment you know, roughly doubling the money. So that in a nutshell is kind of how that piece of it works. What I want to turn to now is just to give you an idea of the differences in the different types of investors that are out there. Um, we have uh, the uh, 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 sort of angel investors that come in kind of two flavors. Uh, the individual and in, in angel investors that are investing, and we'll send you a copy of these slides so you can you can look at this uh, at your at your leisure. Um, and then you have angel groups, which are really looking at uh, 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 things as as a as a as a group of individuals uh, wanting to invest. And Chelsea can certainly talk a lot more about angel groups, and of course there are different flavors of angel groups as well. But in general, I would say angels are looking for a fairly short time frame for the return on their investment. And they're looking for startups that are typically generating revenue, but not necessarily. Some medical devices may come into this, and angels may invest in some medical devices, but typically they're not investing in um, uh, highly regulated fields like uh, FDA approved drugs. And the amount they invest depends in, depending on how large that group is. And then of course, the, the next group are the venture capitalists. And they really fall into two buckets. One of the traditional uh, venture capital group where you've got companies that are pre-revenue, R&D stage companies. They're looking at a three to six, maybe even longer time frame for the return. They're investing uh, more money and they don't have quite as much engagement. They typically sit on board seats as opposed to an angel investor who is gonna be much more engaged perhaps with your company. Um, <clears throat> and then we have corporate venture capital, which are the more strategic investors that are investing, uh, not um, and, and they're they're investing for different reasons, some financial return, but also for some strategic reasons. So, 
let's talk about venture capital and kind of how that world works very quickly. So let's just take an example. Tar Heel Bioventures has a Bioventure Fund 3, which implies they had some other Bioventure funds and they've already invested their money out of those funds, uh, funds uh, one and two. And now they're raising a third fund to invest in life science companies. And they raise that money from limited partners. These are individuals, fund to funds, other sources of capital. And that money goes into the BioVenture Fund 3. So BioVenture Fund 3, they have a successful uh, fundraising effort and Tar Heel BioVentures uh, has their $100 million uh, fund. One question that comes up is how does, how does Tar Heel BioVentures actually uh, run their business? Well, they take a 2% management fee from the, uh, from the fund itself that helps fund their overhead and their costs, their office space, administration, legal fees, things of that nature. And they're gonna invest probably 10 companies or so. The numbers, are, the, it's, a, it's a numbers game. And so they have to invest in enough um, uh, companies to, be, to have a success, but not too many so that, that they spread their money out too thinly. And what's going to happen is they're going to have, using a baseball analogy, they're going to have a, several that are strikeouts. They're going to have some singles. They're going to have some doubles. They may have a triple and they have a home run. They hope that maybe 10, maybe even 20 times their investment that helps pay for at least the strikeouts and some of the singles. And so that's, uh, that's what they're hoping for. They're looking for those big wins that will pay for some of the losses that they incur through, through, the, um, through the strikeouts. And then those returns, uh, of course, go back to Tar Heel BioVentures, who distributes those. They don't distribute 100% of them. They keep part of it for themselves uh, when they go back, uh, when they make the distribution back to limited partners. And that's, a, you know, I've greatly simplified this process, but I just wanted to give you an overview of the mechanics of how, uh, how the money flows through one of these firms. Okay, so switching gears, uh, I want to talk about how to think like an, not an inventor, an investor, pardon the typo. Uh, Steve Hall had a great comment during a panel discussion one time, never give an investor a reason to say no. I think there's, uh, they're always looking for reasons to say no because they see so many deals. So try not to give them a reason up front to say no. So what I want to talk about is this idea of balancing risk and reward. So we've talked about the reward side of the equation a bit, which is, they make an investment, they get some multiple of their investment back. And, but they do that understanding the risks associated with the, uh, with the investment. And so I just wanna run through all these different risks that uh, the investor has to think about. And these are the things you need to be thinking about as you are talking to investors so that you can understand how they think. So technical risk is probably the one that many of you deal with the most. Uh, really, you know, will it work? Is it feasible? Is it translatable? Will it be safe and effective? So that's a that's a big part of making a bringing a product to market is overcoming the technical risk. And the world of drugs and and uh, biomedical things, that's what's difficult because uh, so much of that's unknown compared to th something that's in, on an engineering front, where the technical risk can be worked out or at least understood a little bit better. Regulatory risk, I think it. I think it's pretty straightforward. Will it be approved? Uh, intellectual property risk. Many companies are going into this with patent applications and don't have a, uh, a uh, granted patent. So there's a kind of a risk. Will it be granted? Will the claims, what claims will be allowed? Many times the patent that's applied for isn't, uh, not all the claims are allowed. Is it freedom to operate? What about the university license agreement? There's intellectual property risk associated with that license agreement. Does it need to be renegotiated or does it uh, need to be renegotiated? How easy will that be? Management team risk. You no, know, does a team have the experience to execute? Do they have domain expertise? Can they hire and manage? Can they make good decisions? Of course, market risk and the kind of the parlance of venture capital, will the dogs eat the dog food? And so uh, that's a big part of it. Will there be product adoption? Uh, what does the competition look like? How big is the market? What's the market growth? What about reimbursement? That's, a, that's part of the market adoption as well. Uh, manufacturing and distribution risks. Some products fail because they can't be scaled properly. 
And so that's a, that's a big concern. And then uh, once you've scaled it and once you're ready to sell it, do you have the right channels for distributing the product, uh, either sale, sales and marketing channels or um, channels through uh, partners? So those are all the big areas of risk that people, uh, that investors look at when they're trying to think about this. I would say that the one that they can assess easiest is probably management risk because they can talk to people, they can, they know, they have relationships, they can look at backgrounds, they can understand about the team chemistry, they can see some of that. That's probably the easiest one. Probably the hardest one is a technical risk, especially in the healthcare and the life science world is understanding whether something's going to work, whether it's going to be safe, whether it's going to be effective. Um, and then the others, of course, are, 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 are equally, um, not equally, but they, they're also um, ones that need to be assessed as an investor thinks about an investment. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of this, uh, this area, but um, that's what I have to present today. And I will now turn it over to Matt. Great. Well, th thanks so much, Don. That was that was fantastic, and uh, I think really a great uh, uh, kind of table setter for what I want to talk about with you all, uh, which is really kind of how do you how do you execute uh, on your pitch and and your business model so that you become one of those companies that uh, gets on base to use Don's analogy and uh, is actually very successful. So um, let me just make sure I can display this here for you all so it's big enough. Bear with me. Okay. Go to slideshow and present from the beginning. Beautiful. Thank you, Don. So uh, my name is Matt Meyer, and uh, as Maria said, I work at Wilson Sonsini uh, here in San Francisco, where I uh, work with uh, essentially emerging growth life science companies and help them uh, raise capital, uh, partner their products, and build their companies for success. Uh, Wilson, just briefly, is uh, one of the top law firms in the country, really focusing on life science and technology. We cut our teeth helping companies like Apple Computer, Google, Genentech, go from a very small startup to the successful companies they are today. And while we mainly focus on legal services, such as helping raise money, uh, shoring up IP portfolios and licensing, we now have a business advisory practice, which I'm privileged to lead, which as mentioned, really helps to complement the legal services with business support. So what I wanna to talk to you guys today is really three things. First. VC expectations, kind of building on what Don has talked about, uh, putting together an effective business model. Uh, so you take that idea and you can uh, bring it to market ultimately. And then how do you deliver a winning investor pitch? So I, I'm putting up this, uh, this illustration because I think it's kind of a, a nice metaphor for what it's like being at a startup, right? Because you're really building the rocket ship uh, as it's on the launch pad and, and every day feels like a week or a month. And you have to do a lot of things without a lot of structure, without a lot of resources. So the key is to keep focused on what's most important. And when it comes to raising capital, obviously that's the fuel that you need for your rocket to get off the launch pad. So when we think about uh, raising capital, you know, Don's slide that laid out the different sources of investor funding, I think is really helpful. And I'm hearing my remarks around uh, pitching to these institutional or professional venture capital firms, which as Don indicated, really are geared towards putting money to work in life science startups to fund them through uh, to success. So what are they looking for? What are their expectations? Uh, you know, there are really four things that they typically look for. First is deep domain expertise. They want to invest in people and ventures that really understand their area of, uh, of life sciences. So it doesn't mean that you need to have a PhD or have worked in a given field for decades and decades. Many of you are young entrepreneurs. 
But what it does mean is that you, uh, you know, you do have experience or you have a team that can bring experience to bear. And one of the things to keep in mind is as a startup, you can leverage uh, folks who have more experience by creating advisory boards. A lot of life science companies have what's called a scientific advisory board, which is a collection of medical or scientific experts that are deeply knowledgeable in a given field. So you need to be smart about tapping in to resources like that. And again, through the uh, you know, startup uh, resources you have at UNC, you, you'll be able to do that very well. The second is passion for solving and tackling a hard problem. So what VCs want, they wanna see enthusiasm. They wanna invest in people who are maniacally focused on addressing the problem at hand. So in your pitch, you need to demonstrate a passion. You don't wanna come off overzealous either. You need to do it professionally, but they wanna see people who are completely geared up, committed to doing this. And it doesn't mean that you, you can't have a day job when you're trying to raise money, but you need to indicate how much you care and why you're the one that's gonna drive this uh, product forward and solve that really difficult problem. And then they typically wanna see uh, you working to solve a problem in a big or potentially big market. Why? Because it gets back to what Don was saying. Ultimately, they're investing to make money. There are other drivers, but that's what they care about the most. So they want to invest in a technology or an idea that if it's successful and if it can overcome that technical risk that was mentioned, that they'll make a lot of money. So that means there needs to be a sufficiently large market opportunity that you're addressing. Uh, they also, once you've kind of gotten that content down, they want uh, you to be able to nail these three questions. Why this opportunity? So bridging back to making money, why is this opportunity going to make them money? Why is it relevant? And, and why is it addressing a big problem in a, in a sufficiently large market? Number two, why, why should they invest in you and your team? So this gets back to the passion, the experience, the focus. You need to demonstrate why you're equipped to do this, uh, whereas someone else uh, is not. And then lastly, why now? This is a very important uh, point because, you know, oftentimes entrepreneurs will, will come up with a uh, solution, but there isn't really a problem. So I think you need to keep in mind that timing is everything. Just as we've seen in the pandemic, literally hundreds of companies that have either started up or pivoted their business model to address the pandemic through a vaccine program, a diagnostic or a therapeutic, you need to similarly explain to an investor why it makes sense for them to invest now. And not only why it makes sense, but why it's compelling that they should do it now. And if they don't do it now, they're gonna miss a, a great opportunity. So let's, let's then move on. So now you have a better sense of what the VCs are looking for, what their expectations are. Now let's talk about a business model. So why, why are we bringing up a business model here? It's because oftentimes, if you have a great idea, uh, your ability to articulate how you're gonna take that idea and develop it, get it approved from a regulatory process, get it reimbursed and ultimately onto the market where it's gonna actually generate revenue and make money, that's where things can fall down with, with entrepreneurs. And there are a lot of uh, companies that I've seen where uh, they're not able to really clearly nail the business model. So I wanna spend a couple of minutes going through some, some thoughts on, on what a business model is and what are the key components of it. So first, it's pretty simple. It's essentially a plan for how your technology will generate revenue and make money. Uh, it's essentially right that, that playbook that you need to demonstrate how you're gonna go from an idea or an early stage concept to the market. So as I was saying, in my opinion, this is a, it's, it's really a requirement for success, but a lot of companies or startups will struggle with it. Uh, why? Uh, a lot of them don't appreciate the value. They think that if they just talk about their technology, that that's gonna be enough to get investors interested. And sometimes that's true, but oftentimes it's not. So 
you really need to articulate what that business proposition is. And oftentimes you might have uh, folks on a, on a founder team that don't, they're not sure what that model looks like. So they're not sure exactly what the product, how much it will sell for, especially if it's an early stage idea. And this is not easy because you're essentially having to look to the future. And ultimately it's your vision of where the product will be on the market is going to be very different from where it ultimately will. That's just the nature of developing a product or a service. But the point is you wanna have a game plan to at least envision how it's gonna to get to market so that an investor can say, hey, here's an entrepreneur who has been thoughtful enough not only to come up with this incredible idea or invention or spin out something from a university, but they put in place a, a plan to get it to the market. So again, it may seem basic to many of you, but the reality is this is where a lot of pitches fall down. And it's getting back to the point Don was making with regard to addressing those different elements of risk that an investor looks at. And if you haven't ticked off all of those boxes, which is what a business plan can do, uh, you know, your chances of getting on base to use that baseball metaphor are not gonna be very high. So really the business model should answer these questions. What is your product service or, and benefit to the customer? Who are you gonna ultimately sell it to? In the case of life science companies, this is fairly straightforward. I mean, ultimately, your products are going to help patients, right? Whether it's a diagnostic, a medical device, whether it's a therapeutic, ultimately, they're going to be administered to patients. But you have to think through how, do, how, does, it, how does it get to market? Is it going to be sold directly to a consumer? Is it, a, for example, a point of care diagnostic test? Or is it going to be a pharmaceutical where it's obviously being administered by a physician? So you just want to give some thought to how that works. Uh, how do we get to offer the new product or service? So this is the operational component. So how are you going to produce it? What's, what's the, if you have a, a, a diagnostic test, is it going to be run in a single lab? Or are you going to distribute it through a regional set of labs? Again, if you have an early stage idea, this may seem like, oh, gee, how, I'm not really sure what this is ultimately going to look like. That's okay. You just wanna have kind of a general plan to be able to address this as you're building your business model. And then how do we generate revenue and make it profitable? You know, so many times I've seen companies that have great idea or technology, but they really haven't thought through how does it get reimbursed? And as you know, in life sciences, um, this is very complicated. You have your federal uh, payers, uh, Medicare, which covers uh, elderly and, and, and the very poor through uh, Medicaid. And then you have a range of private payers. So ultimately, you need to be able to explain that you're addressing a critical medical need that's going to help improve patient uh, lives, either reduce disease duration, eliminate disease, prevent it. Whatever it is, you essentially just need to be able to articulate that and then explain why it's going to get paid. No, you don't have to come up with a price uh, for your product today. That's, that's not realistic but you generally need to, I think, address this at some level, even if it's an estimate, you know, you can look at comparable products uh, if there are any on the market and come in at a high level with some, with some plan. So investors will say, hey, here's an entrepreneur who's really thoughtful. They're thinking uh, from a dollars and cents perspective. So some features of a compelling business model, you know, I, I articulate how you're, you're meeting that unmet need uh, how you're solving a problem for customers, uh, why it's innovative and unique. This builds on the patent side of it. Obviously, having a patent protected product or at least a game plan for how you're going to protect it is very critical. Uh, be clear with your objectives. How are you going to develop the product? Uh, financial clarity. What's the revenue plan uh, and how will you get to profitability? Again, not to make light of this as an early stage company, if you have a long road before you're gonna to get to market, uh, having a revenue projection can be difficult, uh, but that's okay. You at least need to talk about the, the size of the addressable market and why you believe your product, given its characteristics and what it's gonna do, will take a, a decent share of that, of that product market opportunity. And then lastly, room for expansion. What does this mean? It means you're not necessarily gonna have a one trick pony you're developing perhaps a platform or you have other products that you think will be developed as a result of your technology. 
in terms of the business model and life sciences, there is no one size fits all, as I mentioned. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility here. Uh, I think the common themes to emphasize are having that strong IP, protecting your, your ideas. Uh, you have a regulatory strategy, meaning you know how it's gonna get through and approved uh, by FDA. Uh, commercially relevant, again, explaining that you're addressing a key market need and it's gonna make money and the payers are gonna cover it. And then talent, uh, building on what Don said, this is addressing the management risk. So you wanna articulate why your team uh, is, is, the, is the right team to drive this, this idea to the market. And as mentioned before, the model is gonna vary based on the nature of your business, if it's a therapeutic, a diagnostic or medical device or digital health service. Uh, this is going to be a little bit varied as a result. So let's say you have the business model down. Um, you kind of understand what the VCs are looking for. So now you're ready to give your pitch. So what are some of the some of the things that that will help you uh, gain success and come out of there hopefully with a yes and, 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 a, and a path to an investment dollars? Uh, you want to make uh, a really clear pitch and focus on the following things. First of all, uh, right off the bat, define your business in a clear single declarative sentence, the proverbial elevator pitch. VCs see oftentimes dozens of companies and pitches in a given week. So they're really you know, oversaturated with opportunities. As, and as mentioned in the COVID times, actually the, the opportunity to start up life science companies and get in, in, uh, funding is, is very good but it also means the VCs are distracted. So you wanna focus on explaining your, your business model crisply. And then the sections that I typically like to see uh, in the pitch are the following. You know, what's the company's purpose? What's the problem? How are you solving it? Why now? What's the market size? What is the competition? Uh, define your product specifically. Uh, the business model, again, just explaining how it's gonna go from development where you are today to the market and make money, highlight the team and its strengths and experience and relevance, and then financials uh, with regard to the projections. Uh, it's very important as you go into these VC meetings to understand who you're talking to. So if it's a VC, an institutional VC, meaning a sophisticated investor, or perhaps an angel investor for some of the earlier stage companies out there that might be talking just to a high net worth individual that might be wanting to write a check to fund it. So understand where they're coming from. Secondly, who are you talking to? Is it someone who has a science background, a legal background, or a business background? Uh, it just helps you because you can hear your comments and anticipate questions based upon their training. What interests them? It's good to do a bit of research just because, you know, in the non-COVID world, when we're back face-to-face, -face, having a two minutes of small talk about something of common interest could make all the difference sometimes in terms of getting these folks comfortable with you. What investments have they made that are relevant? Again, research the VC, understand, have they invested in anything that might be similar or relevant that you can build on as you make your pitch? And then lastly, leverage the network. If you know anyone uh, through LinkedIn that might have connections here to these VCs, it'd be very valuable. Um, lastly, here in terms and, of- and Yeah, man, I was gonna say, I just wanna make sure that we have a few minutes for the Q&A. Is there maybe a quick wrap up of uh, like a short one minute before? Yep. Thanks. Absolutely, sure. So just to, to kind of finish here. So the other thing to say is you want to kind of cut through the noise. Investors have a short attention span. So you want to capture your, your key points quickly, get them engaged. Otherwise, there's a risk that they'll tune out. And uh, then delivering the pitch, know your material, expect the unexpected, keep your tone upbeat but professional, show that enthusiasm, speak. Uh, clearly at a good pace, uh, make sure people hear you, listen, answer questions when asked, don't defer things. Sometimes somebody will ask something and it's on a slide at the end of your deck. I prefer to address it now because you want to address and be engaging with, with your audience and be transparent. Uh, there may be questions where you don't know the answer or it's a difficult answer. I think you know honesty is the best policy there. And last but not least, the pull through. Be clear at the end of the meeting, what are the next steps, send appropriate follow-ups, get organized, keep track of your investors. And remember, this is hard work. Raising money in any environment is not easy, but you just have to keep at it and show enthusiasm and embrace it. 
So with that, I will turn it back to Maria uh, for Q and A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, so yeah, so we saw a very a couple of great presentations uh, on, on on the different sides. One, you know, again, what how to think like an investor, and two, you know, delivering that pitch. So, uh, Chelsea, obviously, you bring the perspective of the angel uh, investor network, uh, and, and Don, you know, working with Hatteras, you also have you know the VC perspective uh, there as well of you, Matt. Um, so. Uh, Don was mentioning you know, the how the different investors, you know, the angels versus the regular venture capitalists, you know, work. You know, so I wanted to get your perspective, Chelsea, on when is the right time for founders to to approach you? Is there anything like us being a company too too early for a conversation? And how, Don, maybe you can give the perspective of how that differs with a regular venture capitalist. Yeah, so I can I can talk a little bit about Kian's perspective. Um, now we, as a heads up, we tend to play a little bit later in the uh, life cycle of the company as far as investment. So we do tend to look at uh, companies that are generating a significant amount of revenue. But that being said, I, I welcome a conversation um, extremely early in the life of a company, um, obviously, a an idea and a prototype is preferable, but if they have minimal traction, um, I would like to meet them if it's if it's something that fits um, the qualifications of our network. Um, and for that, I say that because it allows us to be able to track these companies um, over months to years even um, to see when they get to a place where it, it makes sense for us to fund them. We have some portfolio companies that we started, uh, started speaking to in 2017 and didn't end up funding until 2019 or 2020. So they're, they're definitely a long-term, it's a long-term play. And Don, do you wanna add anything from the uh, VC perspective? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, the whole, everything's built on relationships at the end of the day. And so establishing relationships early is good. Um, there's an adage, whether you believe it or not, if you want, money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. And so uh, I think that most investors are happy to give advice early on if you want just some, you know, hey, I'm just looking for advice right now about where, where to go. But the other thing I would say is that investors love to see progress and momentum. And so if you can have a relationship where you're periodically checking in and saying, I'm not quite ready yet, but here's what, you know, here's my next milestone or here's what I've done. Uh, that's, you know, showing progress is, is really, you know, they, they, they want good trend lines and good momentum. Exactly. And to add on to that, um, a lot of companies will put together an investor update or, a, you know, affiliate update um, that says the progress that they've been making quarterly, monthly. Um, I actually do read those, believe it or not. I get a lot of them. And it's great because I, I can look back at the old one and see, oh, okay, this is what they did last quarter and this is what they're doing this quarter. And it's a way for the companies to stay on my radar once a month without actually having to do a phone call, which might be you know a little awkward if there's no ask, um, but it still, it still keeps them on my radar. Well, I'll have you both uh, also on, on a similar topic. You yeah, obviously you also have, uh, you know, investors thesis or, you know, the, your different portfolio. Is this something that, you know, uh, when a company is approaching you, should they consider what else is in that angel networks uh, or investor groups uh, portfolio? Uh, and what do you consider for, for uh, founders? Do they need to be within a particular field? You know, what do you recommend to, to founders trying to approach you? Should they look at their information, where to find it and so on? It's pretty clear on our website. Um, so it, it is nice to know that companies have read that and understand what we invest in and what we don't invest in. Um, I don't want that to stop people from having a conversation, but to understand that you know if it's pre-revenue, we're probably not gonna be something that we'll move forward with at that time. I think for VCs, it, uh, it's a, it, it can be a bit of a mixed bag, for some VCs, they're, um, you know, they may have 
you know, one investment in gene therapy and they're going to make that one investment. And so they've kind of filled that slot. For others, they may have an expertise in gene therapy. And so there's going to be a lot more gene therapy investments. You just don't know that going in per se, but many times they will tell you, well, we've already you know, invested in this and we've placed our bets in gene therapy. And so we're not going to make any more investment or, you know, several of our, our general partners have expertise in this area and we really like it. And we, you know, like gene therapy or we like oncology. And so you need to kind of get to that fairly early, just to understand if it's a fit. Right. And now from the other perspective, uh, John, you know, as you've been uh, doing a lot of great pitches of, of late, I know, you know, so what have you done? What do you recommend to all the audience of you know, budding entrepreneurs here when you know, both you know, getting in touch with investors as well as you know, pitching? So from, from Matt's presentation, we saw a lot of great tips on, on how to pitch, but also how to approach them. You know, how does that align with your experience? What do you recommend to, to the audience? Yeah, um, I'd have to say everything that uh, Don and Matt have been saying really applies to my experience in terms of raising money over the, I'd say the last 18 months. So it's pretty dead on. Um, you definitely need to uh, use your network. Uh, you should definitely research the investors and the VCs ahead of time uh, because you wanna go in knowledgeable. They wanna know that you've done your homework. Um, so all of that is, is very relevant uh, in terms of knocking on their door, use your network, introductions, are great uh, as, a, as a way in the door. Um, and all of the presentation advice I, I think is, uh, is very dead on. I would uh, encourage and caution investors that this is, this is a long haul. Raising money is, is a lot of work and you're going to do a lot of work over and over again. So I can't think of the number of times I had to create the two minute pitch, the five minute pitch, the 10 minute pitch. Um, and, and, and so you have to very much understand what your objective going into each meeting is. Uh, there's a, there is a saying that you, you, know, you wanna get through this meeting and the end of it is to get the next meeting. And I think that is generally true, but I would also caution that you actually wanna be very careful with your time. What you actually want at the end of the meeting is, are we aligned and should we have another meeting? not, oh, I got another meeting. It's, it, it's, not, it's not a scorecard to do that. So, you know, I think uh, that alignment, getting your message across is really important. And then last thing I would just is, it's, it is an endurance uh, task. Um, you know, we went out to raise money and contacted a large number of people. You know, they, it, I'd say most of them don't reply to you. Uh, some of them will reply politely and tell you that you're not a fit. And then the rest of them, you actually engage in a conversation. So it's really just persistence that, that helps take you through this process. That's great. And just kind of a, a little bit on more on that, you know, what happens when you get a no or like, you know, not much of a, you know, you're not a good fit, you know, how do you get more information from the, the VCs and investors to, uh, on that, you know, on your pitch? Yeah. I think that's very dependent upon the investor or VC as to what their demeanor is as far as giving feedback. Some won't tell you why they're saying no, they give you the polite no, uh, we're busy now or not quite a fit or something like that. And, that. and sometimes you can get a little more information from them. Some VCs are just very upfront and will say, I, I got emails back, here are the three reasons we, uh, here are our three concerns. And, it, and I think there was something in Matt's presentation, you really only get that first engagement. You might get a second engagement where they tell you a little bit more money about things, but then their job is to go find opportunities. It's not to provide you feedback all the time. So you really get a small window of time in which to do that. And then the other part is your, your network. So if you are introduced to them by someone, that person can often tell you you know, through back channels, what what the uh, what the concerns were, and I and I think it is important to follow through and find out what the the nos and the concerns are, because it just prepares you for uh, two things: one, being able to answer those questions up front the next time, but it also helps you refine who actually is the the ideal investor for you. 
And, and I have a few more questions, but I want to remind everybody in the audience that you can also post questions uh, in the chat room or raise your hand and we'll unmute you to ask a question as well. So if you have any questions, go ahead. In the meantime, I'll, I'll continue asking questions because there's a, a lot of things that I'm sure are very interesting about this topic. So, so going on, 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 on that uh, kind of negative feedback or, or the no's and, and anybody feel free to answer this question. It's like, you know, what are some of those warning signs, you know, that the, uh, you know, particularly those that are you know, getting those pitches uh, uh, and evaluating them, you know, what are you know, things that automatically can make you say, oh, I don't want to know anything about this warning sounds, whether it's you know, something they're saying during their pitch or whether they don't have any uh, web presence or so on. So comments from the panel, please. Go, Chelsea. Oh, I was going to tell you to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a really small market, obviously, is, is a no-go for us. Um, so if you're looking at your total addressable market and it's under, we'll call it 250, 250 million, I, I consider that too small. Um, I try to stay away from, we try to stay away from nonprofits. Um, you know, a lot of, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but when, when it comes out with a very strong mission driven nonprofit, um, it's just, it gets into a little bit more of a lifestyle business, maybe not the ability to generate returns that angels are going to require. I mean, Don said it pretty succinctly that, you know, we do the end game is a financial return. I mean, angels that are in can love what they do. They love to be involved uh, with these companies and they love to help, but it's also a financial return. Um, so, you know, nonprofits, mission driven lifestyle business is definitely a no thank you. So I would just say uh, two things. One, read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink mm -hmm. because first impressions, as I tell my children, there's never, there's never a second chance for first impressions. Second, as my father used to recruit students for Burlington Industries years ago, and he said the interview was over after the handshake. And so, have enthusiasm like matt said it's got to you've got to come in with you're so excited to be here today to talk about this great opportunity i mean we're not talking about faking it till you make it but you've got to you've got to believe in what you're what you're doing and especially i would say outside of some of the areas of even like what chelsea deals with and things that are less technically oriented you know people have to be passionate and have to love what they're what they're trying to do so energy makes a big difference when it comes to making those first impressions. And I would just add, you know, as I touched on in my, my presentation, I think the ability to really articulate your product, your, your idea and, and how it's going to make money quickly is critical. If, if you can't do that, it, it's it, it oftentimes uh, people in business can be very polite, but they'll check out and they'll get through the presentation and they'll say no thanks. And uh, so, so just just try to nail it. It's part of that handshake that Don talked about. It's in, in three minutes, can you get that investor, potential investor very excited? So they A, understand what, what it is you're trying to do and how it could make them money. And I know we're at two, so I'll just ask one final question to Matt and maybe add final comments from, from all the panelists. So, so so Matt, uh, one of the key things that we deal with a lot with you know, IP-based startups is that they all have intellectual property. They all want to keep it, you know, you know uh, not not divulge it. So yeah, when is the right time to put a CDA in place? You know, when you're talking with investors. Yeah, that, that's such the the age old question, right? It, it's uh, it's very there's no right answer, uh, but. You know, the, here's the challenge. The challenge is that, and, and, and I know Don and, and Chelsea can speak about this as well. A lot of VCs are reluctant to enter into uh, confidentiality agreements uh, until they're much further down the process for the simple purpose that they're talking with so many companies. And if they end up signing, you know, dozens and dozens of CDAs, their ability to discuss and, and keep things uh, kind of in buckets can be constrained. So, that's the art of pitching. In my experience, you want to hook them 
as much as you can uh, with non-confidential information and get as far down the path as possible before going into a CDA. At the same time, of course, you wanna protect your, your idea and you wanna make sure that it's not disclosed to the extent that someone could take it and, and do something with it. So I think that's my guidance is try to get a VC and investor very excited using as much non-confidential information and listen to what, what they say. You know, some, some VCs are more open to signing CDAs in the past or earlier, but you don't want that to become a gating factor to having a good conversation. Don or Chelsea, any further thoughts from your side? I would just say that uh, I've been surprised how quickly Hatters does sign CDAs. I was under the impression, you know, until recently that they wouldn't sign them until, you know, a lot more, had, a lot more water had gone under the bridge, but they seem to be very open to signing. Now, it's just, it's a good sign, but a lot of times there's really no other way to get the information except by signing a CDA because these companies are so early and they're developing things. Um, I won't sign them. Just, I've, I've met about, I don't know, 300 companies. And if I had all these CDAs flying around everywhere, I just, we're not in the business of stealing ideas. Um, I think, I think maybe we've signed one, um, but we should be, we, we should get to a point where you guys should be able to speak knowledgeably about your company without giving away those trade secrets. Um, until we get further down the line and then, you know, then maybe we'd consider it. But it's, if, if in a first meeting, somebody asked me to sign an NDA, I, no. Yeah, we never sign them the first meeting for sure, but it's usually after the first meeting, they'll, they'll indicate some, some intellectual property that they have that they're willing to discuss further. And that's when the, I don't know, John, what is your experience in, in CDAs with, with VCs from that side? Yeah, I think we've seen both of, there's a group that says exactly what Chelsea says. I, I see hundreds of people. I'm not going to keep track of the paper. And then there's some that will uh, go to a CDA relatively early. For us, um, we didn't, where we drew the line was basically when someone wants a target ID or they want something that is truly proprietary, you, you can't disclose that information without actually having a CDA because that just tells someone where else to go. But as far as I agree with Chelsea, you should be able to tell your story at a high level about your technology without a CDA. Great. Uh, I know like we're a little past the time. So and just wrapping up, any final comments? I know JP Morgan and other conferences are coming soon and many of this uh, the audience will be getting geared to, to pitch for investment in the coming months. What, what final comments and advice would you like to give the audience now. Let's I'll start with Don. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Don. Oh, um, you know, I, I guess I go back to what Steve Hall said. You know, don't don't give uh, don't give investors a reason to say no early on, and because um, the further you get into a relationship, the, uh, the better it can it can be. So it says early on reasons uh, for saying no that you just want to avoid as much as possible. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say, I think with regard to pitching, just practice, 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 and, and have an audience that isn't an echo chamber. Really have people that, that are gonna listen and be uh, constructively critical uh, because it's always a work in progress, your pitch, and, and you just have to nail it and practice is the way to do that. Uh, Chelsea? Um, my advice is a warm intro is always best and it can't hurt to be persistent. Um, we are really busy and sometimes stuff slips through the cracks, but, uh, a gentle nudge never hurt anyone. Um, and I think it's fair to nudge until you get a definitive yes or no. Great. And last but not least, John. I agree. It's a, it's persistence, stick at it, stick with it, practice, 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 uh, one advice I would give is record yourself. I realize this is technical, but use, use your tools, record yourself on video, record your voice, listen to yourself and just practice uh, so that you're ready to go forward. Um, Cause it, that sort of feedback just uh, makes it so, so easy to get into the groove when you start talking to people. 
Thank you so much, everybody. And remember, there's the SBTDC uh, workshops on December the 2nd and 9th for those who are interested in more. And we're here at Kickstart uh, to help and connect you as much as we can as well. And we're always happy to listen to pitches and help drive connections as well. So please do keep in touch with us. And thanks again, all the panelists today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye.